I'd like to thank the organizers for having me here. It's been a real pleasure to attend this meeting. And uh, first, uh, my disclosure, um, I have received in-kind support and some travel funds to attend this meeting from, ingredi from, from Ingredient, and that's shown here. Um, however, Ingredient did not um, participate in the design or concept of the studies, um, nor in the publication, nor in the presentation I'm about to give to you here. So. Okay, so I'm here as an advocate for the underrepresented majority. Uh, these are the bacteria that inhabit each of us. And you might have heard um, in the news or in the literature, uh, we have 10 times more bacterial cells in our body than we have actual somatic human cells in us. And if we add up all the genetic content of these microorganisms, this amounts to being 99% of all the genetic material in our bodies. So in terms of numbers, we have 10 trillion bacteria on us at any one time. The majority of these microbes are found in our digestive tract. And the number that are present in us, each of us right now, is more than the total number of people that have ever been on Earth. So it's no wonder that these microbes could potentially be affecting our health. And we've known for some time that these microorganisms do perform very important functions. Uh, they help metabolize our food, provide us with more energy, um, synthesize vitamins and amino acids, detoxify our foods and our medications, and largely through study of animals that lack exposure to any microorganisms in their lives, we know that these microbes on our, in our bodies um, are essential for proper immune function, intestinal development, um, and overall these microbes also protect against pathogens that we come into contact with. As we're learning more about these microbes in our intestine, we're also starting to appreciate that they're also connected or correlated and sometimes causative for a variety of uh, acute and chronic illnesses. So this figure here summarizes um, some connections we see between the composition, the bacterial species found in our intestines and uh, uh, gastrointestinal illness as well as uh, immune and uh, a metabolic and other uh, conditions and uh, illnesses uh, in people. And of course, we're here uh, to think about diabetes. And certainly, uh, these microorganisms in, in a dysbiotic state um, are associated uh, with uh, changes in neurological function, for instance, uh, reduction of satiety, uh, metabolic function in our liver, adipose tissue, uh, lipid, lipidogenesis uh, in our muscle and, and epithelial function in our intestine. And while some of these data are correlative, um, recent findings from, particularly from Jeff Gordon's group, Washington University, strongly suggest that um, there can, there's a causative effect of obesogenic <laughs> microbiota in our intestine and, and development of, of obesity. So what are the factors that guide the types of microorganisms we'd find in our intestine? Well, certainly our own individual genetics plays some role in the types of bacteria that inhabit our bodies. Um, our age, our microbiota changes from time of birth is through uh, adulthood into old age. Um, our health, <clears throat> as well as our environment. But fortunately, and also um, very relevant to our discussion here at this meeting, is the role of diet as having a tremendous impact on the composition and function of our intestinal microbiota. And this is very well established uh, both in human and animal studies, so I just give a couple examples here. 
Um, in humans, if we look at healthy individuals um, and group them according to rather having a plant-based carbohydrate-rich diet or an animal uh, protein and fat-based diet, the microbiota groups into two different categories. We call these enterotypes, shown here, and this is work out of University of Pennsylvania. Um, you see uh, two different patterns of microbiota in, in these healthy individuals. Uh, at a Paul Tools group in uh, Cork in Ireland, and in elderly populations, um, this figure here is another PCA. Um, where we have the different colors or the different communities in which these elderly people were living. And the lines connect the diet to the total microbial composition um, in the stools of these individuals. So we see this connection between the diet and the composition of the intestinal microbiota of these uh, individuals. Very clearly, it comes out the role of diet in animal studies. So I showed just one example here in the upper right. This is from my lab uh, where mice were given either a high-fat, high-sugar diet or a polysaccharide, plant polysaccharide diet, uh, looking at the total microbiota. And it's each point here represents a different animal. And just to orient you to, to these different figures, the closer the points are to one another, more similar the microbial communities. And on the principal component one, we see this red and green difference. This is a diet difference, so the, the Western or the carbohydrate-rich diet. On the PC2, we see the effect of an additive uh, probiotic uh, lactobacillus into the diet of these animals, which has minor effects compared to the global change in the microbial composition of these animals as a result of different diet. So we're probably familiar with the demise of our uh, coral in the ocean, and I would kind of liken this to our intestinal microbiota in a dysbiotic state and in a less functional state we have with chronic disease um, and potentially different diets. And so that's shown here um, on the left, and we can see a reduction in diversity, introduction of invasive species, and a reduction overall ecosystem function of the coral as opposed to a healthy coral. So uh, we can use diet, and my example here uh, is with providing fermentable carbohydrates to the microbes to help to bioremediate the microbiota in our intestine back to a healthier state. So I'm going to give a couple examples. One is a human study, one is an animal study from my, uh, from my lab, and particularly focusing on um, the uh, microbial response to diet. And the first example um, is part of a collaboration I have with uh, the um, Aarhus University and the lead investigator is Knut Eric Knutsen. And um, his collaborators performed a human study um, in individuals with metabolic syndrome, average age 60 years. Uh, and in this study, the individuals were given uh, crackers and bread enriched in a ravenous island in a resistant starch. Here's the design. Uh, a total of 19 people completed the study, um, fed either uh, the high carbohydrate, this is the high fiber diet, or their normal diet, which is called the Western style diet. And um, really, the, uh, the, they're energy controlled and uh, controlled for different nutrients. Um, where the only difference, significant difference was uh, about threefold higher amount of fiber in the diet up to about, from 20 to about 70 grams per day. And so my role in the project has been to look at how or if the microbes have responded in these individuals um, to the addition of uh, this fiber to their diet. And there's a variety of approaches we can use to do this. Um, we're certainly benefited by the metaomics approaches because so few of these bacteria are actually culturable and easily studied in the laboratory. Um, so what we uh, um, what I'm did so far and what I'm going to focus on um, is this just the taxonomic level, so telling you who's there. And to do this, we use a 16S rRNA gene. This is a gene found in all bacteria. It's a phylogenetic marker, allowing us to identify them and look at their evolutionary relationships. Um, so if the figure on the left summarizes uh, 
the microbial composition as a global whole among these different individuals. And each person has two arrows on this PCA. And uh, the start of the arrow is the start of the intervention. The end of the arrow is at the end. Um, and the red is the Western style diet and the green is the high carbohydrate diet. So <clears throat> what you'll see is majority of the individuals who had the high carbohydrate diet had a very dramatic change in their microbial composition in their stools um, as opposed to the Western diet. And onto the right, um, we also see a greater uh, variation in the response within a single in a person, for, for each person, showing a, again, this is an alpha diver diversity metric on the right, showing a robust response to the fiber. So which microorganisms were changing in response to the Rabinus Island resistant starch? Uh, remarkably, it was one taxon. It was a bifidobacterium that uh, was enriched uh, to the detriment of a variety of other taxa in, in the, these individuals. Um, bifidobacterium, you might have uh, heard or seen on the side of your yogurt containers being a probiotic. Uh, some, some strains are certainly an um, important member of our intestinal microbiota. Um, it's a glycan degrading um, lactate acetate producing bacterium, so short chain fatty acid producer. And we've seen previously to be correlated with, positively correlated with GLP-1 production. Um, the predominance of bifidobacterium in these individuals was uh, uh, from evalidated by finding increased acetate in uh, the stools. Um, and uh, also what happens when bacteria produce acetate, other microbes in the intestine can convert this to butyrate, which is a very, and also a very important uh, short chain fatty acid um, uh, for metabolic health. And uh, <clears throat> this was also enriched in these individuals. Excuse me. So the <clears throat> second uh, example I have for you is a mouse study. Um, of course, with animals, we can, um, they are hypothesis generating, but we can also dig deeper into the mechanisms underlying the effects of these fermentable fibers. And this is a study um, formed in collaboration with Roy Martin and Carolyn Slupsky at uh, UC Davis. So these mice were given a high fat diet, 45% uh, uh, fat, energy from fat, um, and an easily metabolizable starch for nine weeks. And uh, for the remaining uh, time in the study, for another six weeks, half of the mice were given uh, uh, type two resistant starch, and these were energy controlled diets. Looking at the microbial response to the resistant starch at the end of the study, this is, these are sequel contents, um, so closest to the ileum and proximal colon. Um, again, we see a uh, significant enrichment in this bifidobacterium taxa um, in the resistant starch fed animals. So just to orient you, um, this is the proportion of all the bacteria we identified in the, in the cecum of these animals. And um, on the left, we have the resistant starch control, uh, the control animals, and on the right, we have those animals fed resistant starch. Um, and you also see this uh, increase in uh, most animals here in, the, uh, in gold, and this is a, a taxon called allobaculum, and these bacteria produce butyrate. So we see this, again, this connection between bifidobacterium um, and butyrate producers. Uh, what about the physiological response of these, these mice to the inclusion of this type 2 resistant starch? We saw increased gene expression of proglucagon and PYY. We also saw a um, decrease in GIP or uh, glucose-dependent insulotropic uh, peptide. Um, and we also saw a significant increase in both the serum and the adipose tissue of uh, protein level for adiponectin. Interestingly, we also saw heightened immunity in the intestine of these animals, so both in the ileum and the cecum. We saw increased expression of antimicrobial protein, uh, REC3G, as well as an increase in expression of PRRs, including TR, TLR2, TLR4, and the nods. So um, really suggesting there could be a real um, immune stimula stimulatory effect of this fiber. And uh, Carolyn Slupsky, an NMR metab metabolomicist, 
um, has been participating in this work, as I mentioned, and she uh, looked at serum as well as cecal and uh, liver uh, metabolites and showing here just the response in the serum. Uh, so mice given this, these obese mice given the resistant starch, um, have a very different serum metabolite profile. And one interesting finding is that we see a significant reduction in amino acids um, in the serum of uh, the mice uh, given resistant starch. And I think this is notable because in, uh, at least in one study, people with diabetes had heightened levels of uh, proline, citrulline, and ornithine. So here we see a, a potentially beneficial response with regard to amino acid metabolism. And so what we're able to do uh, now is uh, look for connections between the microbial responses, um, the, the organisms that are consuming and exposed to this, this resistant starch, and how this can be translated to physiological outcomes. Uh, so here, um, you probably can't read it in the back, we list all of the different taxa and the different uh, markers we measured, and wherever there's a star is indicating a significant correlation, positive uh, or negative correlation to each of um, these markers. So uh, really we're, where we are is in a frontier of translating how our diet um, is really connected to our health through the microorganisms that inhabit our intestine. So I'd say there's four major areas we're going to see um, advances in how this is uh, connecting. So certainly with carbohydrate metabolism and short-chain fatty acids and the roles of, roles of these short-chain fatty acids in our intestinal and systemic health, that was explained nicely by Mike. We have also amino acid and protein metabolism. Um, maybe didn't really expect to find, giving this additional carbohydrate, how protein metabolism is changing in the intestine. Um, we also have the response of biometabolism and cholesterol metabolism. Um, time to talk about it today. We also see changes in, in, in lipid metabolism in this regard. And um, we uh, also find uh, changes in barrier function and, and heightened immunity in, as a result of working through the, uh, our diet working through our intestinal microbiota. So just to leave you with um, a couple comments. So the uh, fermentable fiber, which is, of course, the topic of this session, um, is going to be really working through uh, microbial metabolism and how those microbes respond. But I would, I would even submit, we, I learned yesterday of how many different diets can actually improve uh, met metabolic health. And so I wonder if there is not a unifying factor and if uh, the, we get for a sort of conserved functional response of the microbiota, and I think that's something to, to consider. Maybe it's not just fiber, but other foods as well that are gonna be affecting our microbiota in, in a way that can improve our, our health. And um, so I think this provides new opportunities um, through understanding the mechanism, how these microbes are consuming our diet to uh, manage and improve our health. Um, so uh, just to acknowledge, uh, Mary Moore, Javad Baroi, and Yusin Say uh, did the work in my lab, and my collaborators are listed on the right. The, the mouse study was, was funded by American Diabetes Association, and the human uh, study was uh, uh, performed with funds from the innovation funds from Denmark. Thank you.